what if Rock Hudson made a movie in the 50s about his real life in the style of one of those 50s movies like Pillow Talk? Straight jacket. I know what I like. It's every Tom, Dick, and Mike. But I've got this problem that I can't get away from. I'm in a straight jacket and I'm gonna get out someday. Tom, Dick, and Harry, Don, Phil, and Larry, Bill, Ted, and Barry, Dan, Ed, and Jerry, Ron, Dean, and Perry, Ben, Stan, and Terry, now, I'm in a straight jacket. Ow! Oh! Miss Hepburn was just telling us that we're number one. To your left is the swinging pad of America's most eligible bachelor, movie star Guy Stone. We love you, Ron! Well, Street Jacket is this movie about a, an actor whose name is Guy Stone. If it ain't broke, it was probably made in America. Who is um, loved by the nation and the world. I mean, his pictures have been incredibly popular. Street Jacket is the story of a uh, Hollywood movie star in the 1950s, not unlike Rock Hudson, who, uh, not unlike Rock Hudson, was gay. And he's into gentlemen. Hi, Guy. Guy Stone is a dog. I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names. When we discover Guy, we find that he basically wants two things in life. Seconds? Maybe tomorrow, cowboy. Butch it up. He just wants to go through as many guys as he can and make as many movies as he can. As far as he's concerned, that's all that life is. That's all it's about. Tony? Other Jeff? Guy, Guy, Guy. <laughs> Cape Cod? Oh, you know me too well. So, who is the lucky winner tonight? Hmm? He's not at all secretive or, or, or careful about his sexuality. He, in fact, he's very, very out there with it. You just, you know, you had to be discreet. And unfortunately, Guy is just not too discreet. Is he smart yet? Let's keep him coming. I mean, this is a time when people just didn't do that. There is a rival actor. Is this about the reefer incident? I, I had no idea that was marijuana. I never would have let those kids buy it off me. Who catches him in a sort of compromising position. <laughs> Hold that smile! Terrible lighting for me. Oh, yes, Guy. That's why we're all so concerned. At those times, they were supposed, you know, they were sort of undercover. Hey, baby. You want a date? No, but I'll take a blowjob. I'll take a ten. Five. Ten. Seven. Ten. Eight. Fifty. Ten. Nine. Twenty-five. Ten. Okay. Freddie Stevens is kind of the villain of the movie. I'm another one of the uh, stars at SRO Pictures. But I'm kind of like the lesser known one. So, it's true. What I'd love is to have guys' roles. When this picture that I took uh, go goes in the paper, um, Guy's got to come up with a way to hide the fact that he's gay. I have to come up with a solution to the problem. You think that looks bad? Imagine getting beaten up by a girl. She's just a ballsy little chick. Oh, I need a little pick-me-up. Which one of these is Judy's? Have you seen Rick? This is not the time or place. You're working. <gasps> Bingo. There's a running gag that goes to the movie that I am actually a lesbian and I don't know it. Um, probably because I've never relaxed enough to have the, you know, allow myself to think that way. Like golf? Love it. <laughs> Finally. Guy Stone is every girl's dream. So, uh, make sure I get slave boy approval, hmm? Sally was played by me, who does not know that he is gay. No, oh, what could I possibly have to say that would interest you? I have no idea. And she is just a, a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, big, big, big Guy Stone fan. No, I'm much more than a fan. <laughs> in fact, the other day, I was reading that article in Screen Idols magazine, uh, Guy Stone's Perfect Woman Checklist, and I realized that I had everything you were looking for except one. That one's usually the deal breaker. His manager comes up with the idea that he'll he'll marry Sally. The studio heads uh, arrange this publicity marriage. They marry him off to this kind of ditzy secretary in the studio. There ought to be a law against driving that drunk. Come on. Do we have to do this tonight? I always wanted a big wedding. His love won't wait. Uh, we set up a thing, and he says that he's mad for her and madly in love with her, and it, they have to stay married for at least a year. The only catch is she's not in on it. 
I just think a man and woman sleeping together is ungodly. Even once they're married? I'm deeply religious. Whoa, 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 wait. Where are you going? Oh, hi, guy. Oh, hi, Gordon. You know the Salvation Army, man? Well, I do a lot of charity work. Thanks a lot. Richard wanted to shoot this like uh, the movies were shot in the 1950s. The form that we were trying to emulate, these 50s comedies, were often based on plays themselves. He wanted to uh, block it out uh, like, like a play, which is what they used to do in these movies, the Rock Cuts and Doors Day type of movies. When you look at them, the camera doesn't cut very much. There are long, swirling shots of the sort that you got in the day, you know, where characters are characters are walking in left and right and overlapping one another and the cameras keeps moving all the time. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Man, I don't think it's cocktail hour. Five. The first day of shooting, we shot a scene that was pages long. In this movie, there's a nine minute scene that doesn't stop. Was an eight and a half page scene with no cuts. Usually in movies, you get each shot is about three seconds long. It's two people talking to each other, and you cut to me talking, and you cut to the next person talking. It was all shot in one big shot. And when you watch the scene, it's really exciting. The camera moving all over the room with us while we're doing it. It was, it was great. We had to rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it to get it all completely right. It took us all day to get it. And I just remember the air conditioning wasn't on yet. It was brutally hot. You had to have that dialogue down. And if one thing messed up, we'd have to go all the way back to the beginning. Matt's flipping over couches, and Carrie comes in. And we spent all day, 12 hours, whatever it was, trying to get one take. And we ended up getting one take that worked. It sort of set a whole mood for everything. That was thrilling. Every time I see that scene, it takes my breath away. He's got this very beautiful, elegant bachelor pad and up in Hollywood Hills, and she starts redecorating from Sears and putting pink lace and frills and all this. Sears came! <laughs> and so she thinks everything's wonderful and uh, thinks she's landed the catch of the country. <laughs> Did I scare you, my darling husband? <laughs> So that's kind of where the comedy ensues, is that she starts taking over his life and change, making all these changes. She does all the things that, that absolutely he does not want her to do. Sally is in love with the idea of Guy Stone at first. This, uh, which is what we do, you know. Uh, we we, we um, idolize our movie stars. We, we think that we know them because we watch them on the screen and we watch them go through things and we think that, it, that they're actually going through that for us. In a way, she's kind of the bad guy because, you know, Guy has to deal with this, this obnoxious woman who doesn't know he's gay and she's invading his life. But Carrie is such a, a, an adorable actress that she brings all these qualities to Sally that are so likable and you end up totally loving that character of Sally and wanting her to, to, to be okay. She does develop a certain real attachment to Guy and Guy to her um, as two people who are forced to live in a situation where they're, they're, they're not living the truth, you know. It's going along fine, the publicity scam works. It's really helping his career. It's getting him all this great press that he's gotten married. They're on the cover of magazines. Sally's in heaven because she gets to be this movie star wife and live this luxurious lifestyle. And things are going smoothly until Rick Foster comes into the picture. We just need to purge the script of all the communist hooey. It's not communist. It's humanist. Yeah, well, the feds get wind of it. They'll ship me back to humanist Russia. Who's this? I'm Rick Foster. I wrote Bloodmine. He um, is to do a, a movie um, that um, is about unions. Rick is a, a novelist who is this kind of bohemian, communist, uh, humanitarian person. He's written this book called Blood Mine that's about coal miners struggling to unionize. And he sold the rights to this Hollywood studio and they're making a movie of the book. And they're making this kind of light, fluffy, Hollywood, dumbed down version of it, which really bothers Rick. 
Uh, maybe we can uh, get Mr. Foster here to make the changes. After all, we could always use a fresh set of green eyes. We need a screenwriter. I don't want the job anyway. What do you mean you don't want the job? This is a major motion picture. This is a major piece of crap. Nobody says no to me. I'll ruin you. You'll never work in pictures again. I don't want to work in pictures. Yeah, well, you're gonna. Saul Ornstein is the typical studio boss from the from the 1950s, and I think probably even today. He's got the cigar, he's always talking about numbers. He's running sort of a B-rate studio. It's never gonna be MGM, it's never gonna be Big Sony. It's, um, he has a lot of, uh, he has a lot to prove. Son of a bitch! Saul offers Rick to rewrite the script. Now Rick wants nothing to do with this. He thinks Hollywood is fake and, and, and false, but Guy Stone, who's on the set, convinces Rick to stick around. So uh, why don't you come by the house later and you can show me some of your material. I'm making a mistake. So are you. You've got a good thing going here. Jerry, I'm a happily married man, but since you brought it up, you don't think that he's... Uh... No. Cut to Guy's house where he's setting up uh, the scene for his seduction of Rick. You're so healthy. <laughs> well, my body is my temple. Wow, you're certainly rolling out the red carpet. You have to with writers. They rule Hollywood. <laughs> then there's this very funny scene, which is very similar to uh, a scene that's straight out of Pillow Talk, where Guy is testing the waters, trying to see if Rick is straight or not. Oh, damn. What? He spilled on my new shirt. Actually, it looks like you got lucky there. That was still too close for comfort. <sighs> hey, you're reading my book. And just when guys kind of flummox Rick just straight out and says, you know, you should just ask if I'm gay. And I don't think guys ever used to that approach before, so he asks and to his delight finds out that Rick is. It's Hollywood. That's supposed to mean something. We're getting off track here. We're both gay. Custom dictates we have sex now. Really an opposites attract story. Uh, Rick is this serious, uh, almost too serious, uh, socially active, radicalized intellectual. And Guy is this movie star who's very footloose, fancy free, uh, loving life, enjoying everything, going with the flow, and not thinking about those issues and just enjoying his kind of luxurious life and taking a pride in the fact that he is so carefree. Nice life you got going here. I suppose so. But the truth is, I'd give it up in a heartbeat for something even more lavish. Then Guy really surprises him. Someone once said that only a few people could hold the entire equation of pictures in their head. F. Scott Fitzgerald. I guess that kid in the car wash men's room was a big reader. <laughs> you are everything I make fun of. I know. This must be hell for you. He realizes, whoa, it's, it's not, you know, there, there could be something a little more real here. He's always sort of been superficial. It's my job to make every man, woman, and child in America love me to pieces. He's always thinks everything's going to go his way, and he actually falls in love for the first time. And so it becomes a love story. So this sets the scene for the real conflict of the movie now, which is Guy's life is going well, especially from his agent's point of view, from the studio's point of view. So now Guy and Rick have to figure out a way to have their relationship on the side and still keep this kind of sham up. The sets don't look at all real. They're very, um, there's no glass in the windows. They're very um, sparsely furnished. They don't really exactly evoke the environments that they're meant to. In the movie, you are able to put together so many uh, period values, graphically or in terms of art direction or color, even the stock that it's shot on and the, the kind of uh, drenched technicolor quality of the picture, you know. The most expensive aspect really was post-production. Um, Richard gets very creative in the post. I knew in the script that Richard was going to be doing a lot of um, CGI. Richard knew he needed to have the outside of Guy's house and it had to be a big, beautiful house. In the 50s with movies, um, you would have the same shot with a matte painting. So he, he uh, decided to do it with CGI. This is kind of like a 50s movie uh, brought into today. Yesterday's matte painting is today's CGI shot. I love you! <gasps> there were great scenes where Carrie Preston, who plays Sally, had to pantomime 
uh, coughing up projectiles out of her mouth. A plum that she's about to eat and she... I love you too, I always have. So marry me. <laughs> You're proposing? Oh, please say yes. You don't expect it and the audience is always, uh, always shocked by that and I love those bits. And she swallows a pencil and, and it shoots out of her mouth. You're welcome. When you see the, the skyline of Los Angeles, that's across the street from Richard's house. He just took it with his digital camera, emailed the picture to the CGI artist, who then added the cleat lights and made it glow. One of the opening shots is a tour bus, and it just goes by the camera, and it says Star Tours on it. But they, they had the bus, but they didn't, it didn't say Star Tours, so they added that later. And it, you just don't even notice that. And um, there's a post office scene where, where half the building and, and a car on the street are, are fake. They're, they were put in later. In the balcony scene between me and Sally, when we're um, making out, if you look carefully above us, there's flying saucers <laughs> in the night sky, and it's really hard to notice, but they just put them there, and um, so now every time I watch that scene, I watch the little, there's three UFOs that go Whoosh! All of the main characters wore, wore wigs for the, the film, and we had to go in and computer, with the computer, paint out all of the wig lines in half of the scenes in the film. I got to wear a terrific wig in this movie, and that was really fun. I always wanted to be able to do that, and I got to in this movie. Let's get this over with, unless the good Lord would do me the favor of dropping a Klieg light on top of me. Sorry. He did that intentionally. Yeah, no kidding, Oscar boy. Around here, we happen to take Captain Astro pretty seriously. <laughs> I'm sure that's just the reefer talking. SRO Pictures is going to do their big picture of the year, and it's going to be Ben-Hur. And um, I want to play Ben-Hur, of course, and Guy uh, gets the part. And I'm very angry. He decides he's had enough of this, and uh, he's going to expose Guy. You want to knock off the innocent act doll? <laughs> we both know your husband's a big hunk and queer, <gasps> and your marriage is... Guy, a homosexual? Please, he lifts weights constantly. Sally has a scene where she plays, plays the piano. It's Guy's birthday present. <laughs> They're oodles of fun at parties. I needed someplace to hide it. She buys a, an organ for Guy. I had it done in walnut, because that's more masculine. <sighs> I suppose Guy will like it. Will Guy like a masculine organ? I think that's a safe bet. <laughs> I don't play the organ, but I did choreograph that whole scene myself. I would sit with the organ and put in a little iPod and uh, just keep going back and choreographing it. Kinds of love. She practiced and she, she works out this whole thing with the keys where every key she hits does something. So that I could hit every single button with every single sound. Richard filmed it really well, and the camera's like spinning around and she's singing and playing this organ. It's so funny. Uh, it was really fun to do. Up with a lot of Jason Claude Pelper. Finish, sir? Yes. What's a brick? Oh, no, let him call you sir, otherwise he blows his paycheck on escorts. Hmm. Victor, you're from Georgia, right? If your intention is to comment on the irony that my forebearers held slaves while I now am one, I've heard it. I play Victor in Straight Jacket. Victor is the gay southern ex-military martial arts butler. Somehow, I can't picture you in the army. Okay, go on. I mean, the part is a, is a dialect part, and he does have a sort of smoothness or bearing about him. I mean, every character you play, you know, you want to inhabit it physically, and you want to find, uh, you know, each character you play has a voice that is particular. It, it may not be a... It's, it's your voice, but it may be a little bit different. Well, it seems a bit mean-spirited to me, subjecting an innocent young woman to emotional cruelty. Well, she gets to live in Beverly Hills. I was referring to myself. And I think the humor in the show really, really works. There's some tremendous 
farcical sequences in it that are throwbacks to an earlier age, an earlier type of screwball comedy that most people have neither the nerve nor the background to attempt. We actually get to the moment where we get to see this movie that's been made. And uh, now all of a sudden, Blood Mine, which Brooke's been working on, but meanwhile as an excuse to see Guy and be with Guy, we go to this movie premiere. And now all of a sudden we can't be together. What do you want me to do? Give up movies? I would. You'd give up writing? If being a writer meant hiding who I was to coddle the bigotries of people who hated me, in a second, then I guess we're different. So I think that really hits Rick, and he realizes, you know, what have I done? I'm, I'm, I'm sacrificing my values for this. So we're at this big after party at Guy's house. Excuse me, have you seen my husband? Yes, yes I have. They try to bring these values into line, try to say, you know, is there a way we can make this work? I uh, end up finding him um, having sex with his boyfriend, and I take a picture of that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God! And there's, there's no questioning what that is. That's, that's probably illegal. Yeah. Now the studio has no choice. There's no way to cover this up. They're going to revoke his contract. They're going to take him off the movie Ben-Hur. Sally gets most of his money because he's lived so extravagantly. Guy has nothing now. And, uh, you know, now all this kind of life of luxury that he's had is, is taken away. I have money. I have lots of money. You saw how I lived. Exactly. There's the house. Sally gets that. Forget about any other studios or television. <sighs> You'll think of something. Not this time. This time. You know, here's another evil we can expose in Hollywood. In addition to these leftists, there's these homosexuals. And so now we're going to expose Guy as a gay communist on a live TV interview. I don't know any gay communists. You know one. You are unbelievable. Well, you sworn off Hollywood anyway. Yeah, well, the whole reason they want him to name names is because it sends a signal. Hollywood has a kind of mob mentality, maybe you've noticed. Oh, please, why don't you tell me all about Hollywood? Here's something we discovered making Straight Jacket, which I thought was interesting, even from the beginning. It sounded like a fun premise, that we're just going to have a gay movie star who falls in love with this guy, but he's in this sham marriage and he can't get to the guy, and the guy judges him for it, and what's he gonna do, and isn't that a comedy, in the same way that Rock Hudson loves Doris Day. The one man Doris Day hates is Rock Hudson. What's he gonna do? He's gonna pretend to be a Texan. What's Guy gonna do? Well, the problem is that Guy's problems are rooted in institutionalized homophobia and have no solution. The struggles within Straight Jacket, within the film itself, totally mimicked what our struggles were with making the film. When Richard originally wrote it, he, he wrote it as a film years ago, and he shopped it around, and the answer he got from people, from actors in Hollywood, was that, oh, he's already played gay. In the world of 50s movies, there was the blacklist, there was homophobia, there was gay bashing, there, there was um, all sorts of bigotries, but they wouldn't be as gritty or as real as in the world of 50s movies as they were in the actual 50s. They would be clean scrubbed. It's very difficult to make a gay film. You, it's hard to get the support, it's hard to get the financing, and it's hard to be accepted. You, actors don't want to play gay. Gay actors don't want to come out. It's, it's, it's a, a myth that's been perpetuated since the beginning of filmmaking that you can't be gay and be an actor and be out and still be a leading man. And that's what's going on with Guy Stone, and that's what's going on as us as filmmakers, because here we are, are we gonna be pigeonholed for making gay movies, and is that wrong? Why shouldn't we make gay movies? There's an audience for it, it's, it's our stories too. I'm sure Miss Hepburn was just telling us to go to hell, and to your left, the pervert palace of America's swishiest, 
Bachelor, movie star Guy Stone. This is me. Excuse me. He changes as a person when he meets Rick. She doesn't know why he's changing, but he's, he changes when he meets Rick. And then I think he changes towards her and he feels compassion for her, where at first he's sort of, girls are icky. Now the stage is set for this kind of finale. It's, you know, how are we all getting out of this? Every life builds toward and then radiates from a single moment. Because movies, for all their cornball reactionary idiocy, show us life as it might be. If only we could live up to our ideals. Movie characters are honest and loyal and brave. They sacrifice themselves for those they love. They are proud of the qualities that make them individuals. They stand up for what's right, no matter the odds or consequences. Movie characters, in short, would not care who plays them. You know, which path are you going to take? Is he going to? Name Rick, is he gonna get his old life back? Is he gonna keep living this lie and have all these things he wanted? Or is he gonna stand up and make a stand and kind of lose everything? It's, it's to show that in this world, everything is pretty. Even the ugly stuff is pretty. And even the complicated problems are easy to solve because that's the internal logic of 50s comedies. I have watched every gay film that has been released in the last five years. I have done my homework, and there is nothing like this film out there. It's honest, it's funny, it's smart, it takes you on a ride. Okay, occasional sex we can work around, but seeing somebody on a regular basis? So you're saying he can never fall in love? I don't make the rules. But you do. We all do. By the example that we set? Okay. Can I just say that's beautiful and retarded? Maybe 50 years from now, a gay actor will be no big deal. But I'm not about to sacrifice God to some cause. In those days, um, and when this was set, like in the 50s and stuff like that, um, this was a scary thing. and There weren't that many people that had come out or expressed themselves. I hope that has uh, the intended effect on the audience of, of them realizing, no, she's wrong. 50 years will go by, and it will be exactly the same situation. And that's unfair. It, it just kind of shakes me because you know it's been 50 years and you know that's not true. It might be slightly less of a big deal. If you decided to film Straight Jacket as a contemporary film instead of a period film, you would have to change practically nothing. It all still holds true today. I'd like to think that things will change in our country. I'd like to think that actors, artists, lawyers, doctors, whoever, whatever it is that you do as a profession can feel comfortable enough to be who you are. That's why this movie's made, you know, to say this is a problem still. So I wonder 50 years from now what it will be like in the year 2054 if somebody else will be doing an interview talking about how, well, it's a little better <laughs> maybe in 2104. It'll be better.